welcome back to anyone who has heard any of my previous readings um, and welcome for the first time to anyone who hasn't I'm fairly new at this and I'm learning and I think I'm improving that's the hope at least who knows right that's for you to judge today I will be reading the Petit Albert the marvelous secrets of little Albert English edition Original edition circa 18th century, new English edition 2016, edited and illustrated by Tarl Warwick. Book description. When the word grimoire is mentioned, the Petit Albert is perhaps the single most notorious book which comes to mind. Originally compiled in the 18th century, it brings together folk magic, talismanic sorcery, ritual and herbal medicine, and a bit of the diabolical, going well beyond the ritual styles of most contemporary writings. Originally in French, and drawing from the prior work of Paracelsus and Agrippa, among others, this collection of operations extends far beyond its native land and to the world at large, the first cosmopolitan grimoire of the pre-modern era, more diabolical than the Red Dragon, and more in-depth than the Black Poulet, Poulet I'm not sure. With regards to talismanic art, the Petit Albert is certainly a force to behold within the realm of occult literature. One thing I want to throw out there is that um, if you have heard some of the previous videos, you can always find interesting connections between a lot of grimoires, especially if you put them in a timeline between, you know, 17th, 18th, 16th century, so on. You see a lot of uh, influence between them, generational influences, um, always take in mind to the context of when they were written and location. Like any kind of historical uh, source, any primary source of any kind, you always want to look at the context and you'll understand the cultural relevance at the time of what was written and why some of those things change, some of the rituals and traditions and things like that change over time, over region. Uh, philosophical influences of the time period things like that it's good to look into uh, having a background in some of those uh, histories regular histories also give you a very good uh, insight into some of these little pieces of occult fun with that said uh, let's get into the adventures the marvelous adventures and spells and magic of little Albert <laughs> As interesting as that name may be. Like other Guimars, this one comes with a warning to the reader. I love these warnings. They're usually they're humorous or, um, you know, maybe they one should take heed. To, but, you know, respect is always important. A warning to the reader. Here is a new edition of the wonderful natural secrets of the little Albert, known in Latin by the title Libellus Alberti Barvi Lucy of Mirabilus Mirabilibus Arcanis Naturae. The author was one of those noble and wise men accused of witchery by the ignorant masses. It was formerly the fate of all the great minds who possessed something extra extraordinary in science as they were treated like magicians. Perhaps that is why this little treasure has become so rare, because the superstitious reject its use, it's almost lost completely. For some wealthy people in the world have been curious enough, those which desire to obtain it, to offer more than a thousand guilders, one copy yet fail to obtain one. We have discovered this work only recently in the library of a very great man who was pleased to give not to deprive the public of such a rich treasure. It can now be obtained for a smaller sum and used for great profit. Curious will not mind the old and rudimentary language of the book. We preferred to leave it as we found it, rather than to change something for fear of altering its true meaning. Besides, we will not be sorry that we have added to the end of this treasure additional wondrous secrets given by a person of great experience, and it is often talked about in the book some secret hours of the planets will be found at the end of this work in tables that mark the time of sunrise for every day of the year in order not to deceive 
the hours that each planet governs. For one must know that time thereby is marked from dawn rather than the middle of the night, as some believe erroneously. So according to that little warning, we're getting the real deal here. Unaltered. Uncensored. That's good. That's how I like all my books. Assuming all that was true. The Treasure of Wondrous Secrets Those with curiosity who wish to enjoy the most rare and most hidden secrets of nature must, with openness of heart, listen carefully to what is written here in these pages. It may well be called a universal secret, because it contains in its pages many wonders able to please all mankind, the noble as the commoner, merchant as the foot soldier, the warrior as peaceful, the squire as damsel, corrupted woman as virgin, and above all, the good conductor of his family, will take all that into my own experience have proven to their advantage and to satisfy their inclination and enable their greatest desires. However, in order to keep some methodical order in this book and to make it more pleasant and helpful to my readers, I will distinguish each of the material separately, lest the indiscreet mixture bring an embarrassing confusion. I mean when I discuss, for example, the secrets of love or war, I will proceed with the content, the content immediately and without interruption when I am giving these topics or anything on the topic of natural science. I list elsewhere a few secrets that are right to love or war. I warn my readers indicating the places where they can find these secrets. It is good to similarly warn my readers that, while these may seem supreme secrets which I offer them in this small volume, they will not supersede the occult forces of nature, that is to say, of all the created beings that are scattered in this vast universe, whether in heaven, in the air, or land, or in the water. For so it is written that the sage will rule the stars by his prudence, and it shall be seen that the stars by their gentle influences will benefit the wise and instruct through their ascendancy. Now it is necessary to know the arrangements and rising of the stars in their course, for other forces are subjugated to these. As well as the stars, it is commonly understood that the planets have their own day in the course of the week. The sun, Sunday, moon for Monday, Mars for Tuesday, Mercury for Wednesday, Jupiter for Thursday, Venus for Friday, Saturn for Saturday. I've seen variations of that, so I guess depending on the grimoire, the source, you might get a different definition of what days belong to what celestial bodies. Moving on. Those who have not studied in the sublime philosophy of science and astronomy must do so or else consult astrologers or use a good almanac when they want to practice some secrets here which are dependent upon or in conjunction to the stars, so that the accuracy that they will bring in the op operation they will do will create a proper outcome. These are not attributed to magic or devilry, though in some of the wonderful secrets that I will give are used certain words or figures, because they have their virtue and e efficiency regardless of magics and ancient Hebrew sages have used it with their own religion. The chroniclers of France tell us that Charlemagne received from Pope a little more which was composed only of figures and mysterious words which this prince happily utilized upon many occasions. This small book is titled Inquiridium Leonis Papae, the wonders that with this short work has produced in short of those who have used it have made it notorious despite those who wanted to disparage the book as superstitious. Finally, I warn my readers, another warning, I warn my readers that they will find nothing common or trivial in this little book. It is like an extract and elixir that aids in the improving of nature, as well as far more wonderful in its occult virtues. I have let myself be seduced to vanity. At times, my, by believing that I have performed these works under my own power, I confess that I have learned from the writings of famous philosophers that have not penetrated these arts with great power, applying everything secret within all of nature. I do not say this for the sake of my ego, for many others have done similarly. It's a little humility. Humility is a good thing uh, when you're performing some of these operations as they like to call them, um, rituals and otherwise. 
uh, on humility in general, you know, a humble disposition is always good. Uh, unless, of course, confidence reigns supreme in a particular environment or situation. But in most cases, uh, a little bit of humility can get you far. Not just in the case of the occult, just in life in general. A lot of people believe that their opinions and thoughts are valid merely because it is their own. They are not always valid, especially when being fueled by ignorance or just a general lack of interest in the subject outside of how it affects you as a person, as an individual. Most people don't see beyond that scope. And in the case of the occult, one must. You don't have a choice. You're dealing with things far beyond you, far beyond your personal interests, your personal desires. If you approach it in that way, the way you may approach other things, other topics of interest, of debate, you're in for a world of hurt sometimes. Keep that in mind. Sorry for being so somber about it. Let's have a little more fun and keep going. To obtain love. Since there is nothing more natural for man to love and to be loved, I shall begin the content of my little treasure with secrets that lead to this end. It is no small task to invoke Venus and Cupid, which are the two dominant deities of this noble human passion. I will say that Mother Nature, who made all things for man, produced large numbers of creatures with days favorable to them and the success of their passion. It is often found at the front of the foal, a piece of flesh, which I give here the figure, which is powerful for obtaining love, because if we can have that piece of flesh, the ancients called Hippomenus, we will make it dry in a clay pot, finely glazed in a furnace. When dinner is being eaten, wear the piece of flesh on your body, and then doing touch the person you want to be loved by. Love can also be obtained by anyone. If they swallow only a piece of this flesh, the size of two peas in a liqueur, jam or stew, the effect is certain. And as Friday is the day dedicated to Venus, which governs the mysteries of love, it will be good to perform such works on that day. John Baptiste Porta has remarked upon the surprising properties of the Hippobanus to cause love. I don't personally know much about that particular piece of flesh. All I know is that it belongs to a foal after born, usually attached to its head. Um, it's like a growth of some kind. I've heard of people using it for a variety of medicinal purposes. Um, I've heard about it being used for ritual purposes, things like that. So it's interesting to note. Do a little more research on that sometime. Another method. On Friday in spring, put to dry in the oven in a small pot, as stated above. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this right, but the hippomenus, along with the ears of a hare and the liver of a dove. Dry it into powder and say the name of the person you wish to be loved by while it is drying. Consume a bit of the powder about the size of half a drachma, and the effect does not allow the first time. Repeat up to three times, and you will be loved. So it states another method, another method. So there's quite a few methods listed here for love purposes in particular. And this one says something a little different. Another to secure perpetual love. It is not enough for a man to be loved by the woman only for one occasion or temporarily. This passion ought to persist and true love is indissoluble. And thus he needs to have a secret art to engage the woman which won't alter or diminish over time. Take the sinews of the foot of a wolf and make a mixed ointment using all powdered amber and powdered reindeer moss. You will carry the ointment with you and you will sniff it from time to time in the presence of the woman you desire. She will love you increasingly. And here we have more methods listed. And just like about two more and it moves on to something else. But just really quickly, I mean, when it comes to obviously uh, adjusting the free will of another human being, always be careful. Um, 
it can have its consequences. But generally speaking, uh, I believe that a lot of these particular spells, um, when thrust upon another, generally will only increase whatever love may have already existed. If in fact, you know, these are potent or work at all. <laughs> but, um, you know, depends on who you ask, I guess, and those involved. But uh, I think generally, like I mentioned, you don't want to do this to anyone that has a already disdain for you or has an indifference toward you that can't blossom. But otherwise, I mean, who am I to say what one cannot practice or practice? Take and do what you will, but there are always consequences for any action, especially in those involving human will. Going on. Defending against the curse of the lanyard. I don't like wearing them either, but... Our elders assure us that these are effective defenses against the sorcery of the knotted lanyard. If fasting, eat a roast with blessed salt. If you breathe the smoke of burning tooth of a man dead, it has the same effect. Ooh, that must smell great. The same effect also happens if you put quicksilver in a torch or of oat straw or wheat straw. This is placed under the pillow of the bed where the hex individual sleeps. If a man and a woman are afflicted with this charm, it is necessary to be healed. Thus, the man pees through his wife's, through his wife's wedding ring while she holds his. <laughs> now, that's, that's, would be an interesting request, right? Unless uh, your spouse is familiar or is aware of what you're trying to do. You want to go ahead and pee through her ring while she holds yours. I'm guessing uh, you, the both parties have to be aware when this occurs. You can't just hand uh, your spouse the ring and then go into the other room or say you have to rush to the bathroom and pee through her ring. Somehow you'd have to convince her to remove it unless she does so every night or before showers. So there it is. To moderate the female sex drive, reduce a Red Bull's dried penis to powder and add a bit of powder weighing about half an ounce to a broth made of veal, lettuce, purslane, and feed it to the immodest woman. This will modulate her sexual desires. So uh, I guess for the overzealous lady, that's one way to put it if you're not interested. That's one way to handle it. Um, or for any of you females out there that uh, want to quell your sex drive if it's far too potent at times, it doesn't say anything here that you can't uh, consume it yourself in order to kind of lower that libido just a little bit, at least temporarily. To know if a girl is pure or corrupted, you will reduce black coal to fine powder. You will take the weight of a shield and powdered coal to the girl. If the girl has been corrupted, it will be impossible for her to hold her urine, and she will need to urinate. If instead the girl is chaste, she will retain her urine. Amber, yellow, or white, which is made into necklaces and rosaries, produce the same event. If it is used with the same preparation as the charcoal or else porcelain seed, leaf, cocklebur, root, powdered, and the same in a broth to drink with liquor or other materi materials, they all serve the same. Of course, this is written for its time. I'm sure many of you disagree on the notion of lack of virginity equaling corruption. I I'm guessing that's what it's referring to, considering the requirement of retaining urine. If only it could detect when a woman or a girl is corrupted, soul-wise, or in her heart. That might actually be more useful than knowing whether or not she's a virgin. Lists a few other methods. Well, here we go. We could also restore virginity. 
So I've heard of born again virgins, but this is probably something else. Take a half ounce of turpentine, a little juice from macerated asparagus, mineral oil infused into a quarter ounce of lemon juice or juice of green plums and fresh egg, white with a little oatmeal. Make this all into a bolus and have some consistency and you will put it in the vagina of the girl after defloration with goat milk and anointed ointment of white racis. You will not have practiced the secret four or five minutes. The girl will return to the state of virginity to deceive the matron who would wish to visit. Distilled water with lemon juice being applied several days in the vagina of the girl as the same effect as the ointment is applied as before. I would not recommend doing this. Um, luckily, we don't have to really worry too much about matrons, at least in the Western world, um, checking for virginity. Um, I also do not recommend this because it looks like it would give you quite the infection, especially since milk or goat milk would have sugar. And unless you're looking forward to a nice yeast infection, I, I really don't think this is the way to restore your virginity. Assuming it could be restored at all. And assuming it even matters. Continuing forward. To prevent your woman from fornicating. To rejuvenate wrinkled skin due to childbirth. Well, that one would be really popular, right? People like writing articles about that all the time. You shall compose an ointment with turpentine, milk, asparagus, leaves, soft white cheese, and the powdered quartz. And having rubbed the stomach with a sponge soaked with lemon, apply a patch of that ointment on the stomach and repeat this several times, and the marks of childbirth will wane. For women to dream of seeing the man they should marry. That's fun. You must have a small branch of the tree called poplar and should bind this to a white piece of cord down with your pants. After putting under the bed where you have to sleep at night, rub your temples with a bit of blood from the ho hopoe or hoopoe bird. And while, lay while lying, say the following invocation. Clem Clementissime Kyrios quod a Abraham servo tuo dedesti uxorum saram e filio ejus obedientissimo admirabile per signum indicati rebecam uxorum indica mihi ansela tua que, quem sim nuptura virum per ministerium tuorum spiritum valideth asaibi abumalith amen I know I chopped that up pretty bad but I'm trying the next morning when you awake, get back in mind what you have seen in a dream during the night. And sleeping in if you did, did not see the man's... Wait. Sleeping in if you did not see any man's appearance. You must continue during the night, three Fridays in a row. If you have not seen the representation of a man during the three nights, you may believe that you will not be married. Widows can use this powder as well as unmarried girls. With this difference, that instead of placing the rod under the bed or at the bedside, widows must place the poplar at the foot of the bed and then there's a spell for men to do the same to keep men loyal to cause a girl to dance naked all right to prosper at gambling to prosper at fishing and that one has a few methods to keep birds out of your crops. I'm sure most of us don't have to worry about that nowadays. But it will be useful if, in fact, you have crops. Not to say it's not. It's very useful. To hunt birds effectively. So you're going to go duck hunting. It's pretty handy. A few methods for that one. Quite a few methods listed. To prevent dogs from becoming aggressive. Another method to prevent rabies. To ward off wolves. To prevent drunkenness. Okay, well, there we go. That's always handy. I like to read these. I don't want that hangover either. As man has nothing more valuable than his reason, and it becomes absent when too much wine is drunk, 
it is proper to give him a method to protect against it. When you are invited to a meal where you fear to succumb to the sweet violence of Bacchus, you drink before you sit two tablespoons of figwort and a dollop of good olive oil. And you can drink wine safely. I'm going to start using that when I'm getting, you know, particularly intoxicated at any point. I am submitting to the sweet violence of Bacchus. Bacchus. Bacchus's violence. <laughs> you shall observe the glass or cup in which you will be served a drink. Do not sate yourself with sweet foods or potatoes, because both of these foods contribute much to the drunkenness. If one becomes intoxicated, he must, for the man, wrap his genitals in a cloth that is soaked in strong vinegar, and the woman who has succumbed to the intoxication should put similar cloth in her nipples, on her nipples, and it will come back to their senses. <laughs> I don't think I'll be doing that. It doesn't sound comfortable, and I'm sure vinegar, you know, won't be great, especially if in that drunken stupor you uh, have a partner available to partake in other sweet violences. To restore stall wine, stale wine methods listed to make excellent vinegar. There you go. You can use that vinegar to wrap around your genitals, boys, to make sure you don't get drunk. I'm guessing the better the vinegar, the more potent, the sober, the sobering, um, what's the word, the sobering, not parameters, but qualifications, I guess. Making good liqueurs, an excellent and fast hippocras. The true water of Armenia. Growing sweet melons, growing good grapes, to prosper at growing wheat, to prevent animals from destroying your crops, to divine whether next year's planting will be good. A few methods are listed. Oh, here's a good useful one. To defend against illness. Everyone's so concerned with illness right now. Should they be? I don't know. But... A lot of illness is uh, apparently in need of defense of, so here's a good option. Foul smells are naturally contrary to the human health, and the stench is sometimes fatal. As Fioraventus wrote, who says that if you take the wilt who says that if you take the filth of human blood and legmatic fluids well dried up it is mixed with Styrax, and these are burned in a room. The stench will be fatal. Hmm. I don't want to test that out, though I doubt it. To be protected against these deadly infections, I will propose a sovereign antidote which will triumph over all kinds of venoms and poisons. Wow. You will take in the growing season the leaves of the Hyper... Hyper... Hy Hypericum because it casts its flower as much as you are able to hold in your hands, put them in the sun with four pounds of olive oil for 10 days, and they will expose them to, then expose them to the stove in a water bath, in hot water, and then you will press the juice out of the leaves and will put it in a vessel or bottle, or strong glass jar, and when the worst is flowered, and the wart is flowered and seed, you will put a handful of that seed and the flowers in the jar as well and will boil all boil it all on the fire in a water bath for one hour then you will add 30 scorpions a serpent and a green frog make sure it's green <laughs> not a yellow frog not an orange frog a green frog you shall cut off their heads and feet and after a bit boil it also you will put two ounces of each herb following and thereafter crushed crushed gentian root, white dictatum, the root of the tormentil, rhubarb, and the armedian bowl, thus prepared. The ointment ought to be green in color. Green. Very, very important. All this will be exposed to the sun during the scorching days of midsummer. After having well sealed the jar, and finally you must deposit the jar for three months in compost, composting manure. And after that time, you will remove the jar from the manure and keep the treasure in a vase of tin or strong glass to use it. The usage is to rub around the heart, 
the temples, the nostrils, the sides, along the spine, and you will feel that this antidote against all kinds of poisons. It is also good to cure the bites of venomous beasts. So you get bit by a cobra or a nasty little spider, just go ahead and rub the stuff all over your face. It's going to stink real good and it's going to help you out. But apparently it takes a few months to prepare, so make it ahead of time. You don't want to get suddenly sick and you know, it might keel over before it's ready. Ancient talismans and the usage thereof. Talisman of the sun for Sunday. So we have some images here. Interesting images. Showing you the talisman itself. Purchase the book if you'd like to see it. Talisman of the moon for Monday. Next we have various talismans or representation. The image imagery that's required nor the numbers associated all vital information for their use or their proper use formulating talisman used by other cabalists it's got more information on that salamanders gnomes nymphs and sylphs Ooh, okay that one i gotta read I will turn perhaps many people against me if I say that there are creatures in the four elements that are neither pure animals or, or men, although they have the capability of reason without having a true soul. The famous Paracelsus speaks even more clearly, saying that these people are not the elements of the lineage of Adam, although they appear to be genuine men, but they are instead species of creatures, always different from ours. Porphyry mentioning Paracelsus said that not only are these creatures reasonable, but even are are able to love and serve God through worship, and as proof of their words, he speaks of a sublime oration here. And very mysterious are those creatures that live in the element of fire, as the salamanders do. Maybe I will ask my readers to speak on this subject, which may be useful should another bo such book as this one be made. So now he starts re listing the various operations of the creatures he mentions, such as the salamander. and other sorts of creatures. Let me see here. As well as gnomes. And what ancient philosophers said of them. It says gnomes inhabit these regions. Wait, okay. Let me go back a little. Those who have traveled in the northern countries and above all the Lapland cannot ignore the fact that gnomes inhabit these regions to guarantee safety, warning the people when they work. They help keep the land, make the people acquainted with the places where mines are most abundant in precious metals. The Laps are so much accustomed to the frequency, frequent appearance of gnomes, such that far from being frightened, they are saddened when they do not appear, when they are working in the mines, because it is a sign that these mines are filled with impure ores, when there are no gnomes therein. It is a popular claim that the creator has committed gnomes to guard subterranean wealth and they have the ability to deliver, deliver the same wealth as they see fit. So those are good to have when you're looking for gold. Hear those mining companies out there, silver mining and all that. Keep hearing a return to gold from various sources. You better have some gnomes nearby. They're quite handy. Moves on to perfume for Sunday in the sun. So various perfumes so that one can mix the air with some interesting fragrances associated to the day that you need it to go by well. More symbology. It tells you how to spot fake mandrakes. Hmm. So uh, it's interesting. I didn't know that mandrakes can be faked but let's see how these are people who abuse the credibility and simplicity of good folk which use trickery to profit or which do the same with certain lesser supernatural forces one of these is the artificial mandrake with which they debase the divine oracles as i passed my little into my little in flanders i was invited by one of my friends to accompany her to an old woman who spoke the future who passed through a great soothsayer, and I discovered her deceit. 
which could not be hid a long time as it was fairly crude. The old woman led us into a small dark room, lit only by a lamp. The light which one saw rested on a table covered with a cloth, upon which was a kind of small doll sitting on the tripod, with arm, one arm extended holding the same left hand, a small string of strong untied silk, after which beside it was a small polished iron rod, and below it there was a glass fern, and there was a fly in the glass which stood approximately the height of two fingers. The trick was that the old woman commanded the mandrake to strike the glass with its rod to answer the question when really it was just a fly doing so. The old fraud, for example, said, I command thee, mandrake, on behalf of the one to whom you obey, that if Mr. So-and-so should have a good trip, hit the rod three times against the glass. So I'm guessing some form of fly-related trickery was involved. But does that make the mandrake itself artificial? Just because it didn't work. Maybe it was just a faulty mandrake. <laughs> um, goes on to similar subjects regarding mandrakes, the falsifying of magics, things like that. Ooh, this could be very handy. To whom? I dare not ask, but it could be. To make a person insensible to torture. To elaborate on the methods of criminals as before, I will retort, report the details of what I learned of Mr. Bamberge, a famous criminal judge at Oxford. He said he had seen several times in certain cases there that torture was sometimes insufficient to draw testimony from the charged, since their crimes had been committed in secret and that it was difficult to find witnesses through where strong presumptions against them and that these people tried so hard to keep their crimes a secret that the court had to release others to secure their testimony. Well, that or they were innocent and didn't know what the hell they were trying to get them convinced to or didn't do it, but whatever. There are some as well who perform incantations to protect themselves from the torture's effects. The torturers like effects others keep spells written on parchment on their persons here are three verses they speak when tortured to defend against us impetibus meditis tria duri corpora ramis dismas e gistas augustas in medio is potestas divina damanatur dismas gestas have Astra Lavato. There are more words spoken when they are currently applied to torture. As the pale and glorious Virgin Mary was sweet and gentle to our Lord Jesus Christ, such is this torture soft and the rope gentle to my body. So mantras of sorts against torture. Ointments to protect against fire to create Greek fire. That's fun stuff. Secret garters for travelers. Secret sticks for travelers. Ah. So it tells you how to construct a staff that will protect you from high women, wild beasts, rabid, rabid dogs, snakes, or inns and places you seek rest. Oh, it'll protect you in those places. Remember those things secret to making horse travel quickly to make an angry horse tame to cause a horse to appear deceased <laughs> interesting the ring of invisibility always the rings and always the invisibility we find them so often and always the invisibility just in general in these grimoires a lot of people want to be invisible it's understandable sometimes I want to be invisible myself I'm sure everyone has been an instance in which they could be. Well, this little book can tell you how to construct a ring that will allow you to do this. You can be a regular Frodo Baggins. So the book continues on. I'm only about a little over halfway through. But I don't want to ruin the rest for anyone. As you can see, it goes into various details for all sorts of needs and wants. Um, I would recommend it if uh, you want to practice some very ancient, very old magic. Uh, and, um, you know, just be careful how you use it. Do your research. Pay your respects. And as the warning stated at the beginning, 
show a humble, approach it with a humble nature, with a humility that um, allows you to admit that you are a faulty, erroneous creature like the rest of us. Thank you for listening and have yourself a wonderful, wonderful evening or morning, whichever.